those who are new, for those who are new to this subject, of course, you have the period of kind of high socialism, basically from 1949 all the way through the late 70s, early 80s, where all films are essentially propagandistic, right? With there's a very there, there's very stringent limitations in place to creative people in terms of what types of films they can even make. And so you have limited genres, you have the war film, um, you don't have romances, you don't have martial arts films, you don't, uh, I mean, all of these kind of entertainment style films are basically pushed aside in mainland China. They do exist in Hong Kong and Taiwan, but in mainland China, everything is very much dominated by this political overtone. Um, and a lot of that spins out from something that happened in 1942. Anybody know what happened in 1942? No? Mao Zedong uh, gave a series of lectures called the 1942 Yan'an Talks on Art and Literature. And it was a series of lectures that basically set the theoretical framework for what art should do in society. And so and, and, the, and what he said in those lectures uh, was essentially that all art should serve politics. It should have a pragmatic and engagement with politics. It should be made for the classes of people that most need art, which he deemed to be the workers, the peasants, and the soldiers, not intellectuals. Uh, art isn't, I mean, today when we think about art, you think of the leisure class, you know, people with disposable income who go to a museum and look at nice, beautiful paintings. That's not what art was about. And art was, and there were basically two types of art. And one was correct art and one was incorrect art, which is very strange for us if you grew up in the West, at least, to think of art as correct or incorrect. Um, you might think of it as good or bad or inspiring, or we could use all kinds of adjectives, but we usually don't think of art as being politically correct or politically incorrect. But that was the main rubric through which all art, including film, was judged and created for the next many, many decades. When we get to the 80s and we emerge from the Cultural Revolution and you have the reform era under Deng Xiaoping, you have a new radical transformation of the filmscape because all of a sudden, uh, Chinese artists start to rediscover their cultural roots, Buddhism, Taoism, Confucianism, uh, Tai Chi, you know, martial arts, all of these types of kind of quintessential elements in Chinese history and culture, which had been suppressed and pushed aside, become re-embraced and those start reappearing in film. Simultaneous to that, you also have the open door to the West. And so overnight, the doors open and you've got Western philosophy, literature, film, um, all kinds of creative, you know, everything from Kenny G to, uh, you know, Michael Jackson to Nietzsche and Schopenhauer and, um, you know, Western classical music. I mean, all of these things get intertwined in a big mishmash and just flood into China. And that has a radical impact on all culture, but especially the film world. And so in 19, around 1984, 83, 84, you have the rise of what's called the fifth generation, which is essentially the Chinese new wave. And so you start getting more art film coming out of China and more experimental film. You also start getting the rise of commercial film. Uh, so film comedies, you know, martial arts films, detective films, thrillers, um, the types of films that are not 100% dictated by a political mandate. And that continues. And this is, if we had to look at Chinese film history, if I had to break it down, say into three phases, I would look at phase one as that kind of high socialist period where politics ruled everything. This is phase two, where you have the rise of art cinema and different forms of, of, of film that start to um, emerge. And then if we fast forward into the late 90s, into the early 2000s, all the way up into the present, we have the rise of commercial cinema. And this has been the, probably the single most transformative shift in Chinese film history. So the Chinese box office for all of modern Chinese history, from, well, PRC history from 49 all the way into the 90s, it wasn't even in the top 20 or 30 globally in terms of global box office. Today, it's number one globally. And so just in the course of the last 20 years, the commercial rise of Chinese cinema was a juggernaut, just massive. Um, part of that was fueled by 
you know, the rise, in, you know, all the, the economic transformation of China, right? The miracle that we've seen play out over the last couple of decades. Uh, but your question specifically honed in on this more nationalistic kind of thrust, Jason, that's been happening in, in Chinese cinema of late. And indeed, one, one aspect to the commercial rise of Chinese cinema is also the way in which a lot of filmmakers in China and the government have found ways to marry commercial cinema with political cinema. Um, and so I think for there was a period of time where I thought the world of Mao's 1942 talks was of the past. We had kind of moved behind that. We were in a new phase, but especially during the last five to 10 years and even more so under Xi Jinping's rule, we've seen ways of taking that political ideology that was so prominent during the first phase of Chinese film history and re-injecting it into commercial cinema. And this started, I mean, it's been going on for a long time, but often it wasn't very successful. You would have these so-called uh, Jushanlu or main melody films, propaganda films, and not everybody would take them seriously. You know, a lot of people would just you know, people would hand out free tickets at work units in China, encouraging people to go and people would kind of roll their eyes and wouldn't really take it serious. But what happened around 2009, um, there was a series of films, one called Founding of the Great Republic, another called, I believe, Founding of the Party. And these are essentially historical films about celebrating uh, pivotal moments in the history of the Chinese Communist Party and the struggle uh, to establish this new nation and the party, et cetera. What those films, these are essentially propaganda films, but what they did was they cast A-list Chinese stars and not just one or two, but basically every Chinese A-list star you could imagine appeared in cameos in these films and they were extremely successful commercially. And that was where the kind of green light first went on that, wow, we can take Hollywood style star system and using star power <laughs> to try to push our kind of political views and, and bring them together in a more organic way. And, and it would, those were a little clumsy, but over the next couple of years, they would keep reinventing this formula. And so you fast forward to say 2017, you have a film like Wolf Warrior Two, which is borrows from American action film structures of like Rambo and Arnold Schwarzenegger films from the eighties. Um, and it's set in Africa and it's got a Chinese soldier hero. Um, it's kind of a renegade and it's very much a flag waving patriotic film, but they hired a Hollywood action cinematog action director, the same guy who did the Avengers and did the Captain America movies. Um, they have Hollywood actors, a Hollywood composer, and essentially they're using top Hollywood talent to package a, a, not just talent, but also Hollywood test road proven genres that work, right? The action film, the 80s action film, but they're using it to wrap it in a more propagandistic message. And that was so successful, it made somewhere in the neighborhood of $800 million. Um, if you're not familiar with what global box offices look like, I mean, a film to make that much money, this is getting close to the so-called billion dollar club for Hollywood, you need the Avengers, <laughs> you need Iron Man, you need one of these tentpole um, action franchises usually to get into the billion dollar mark and you need a global market. And this is essential. Um, films like, you know, uh, just a, a film like I say, Avengers Endgame has a budget maybe of 200 or $300 million. And with a budget, a bloated budget like that, they need all of these international markets to make their money back. Wolf Warrior 2, I think it was made for maybe 50 or $60 million. And it made a comparable amount in terms of its box office earnings. But here's the real key. It did it in one market. They didn't need America. They didn't need Canada. They didn't need Japan. They needed just China. And, and so that's the real shift here is that we see this new, um, and the emergence of the Chinese market, not only as able to produce these kind of more propagandistic films that borrow from commercial elements and marry them together in a way that works with local audiences. And Wolf Warrior 2 was not an anomaly. We've had many films since then, Red High, uh, the uh, Hong Hai Xingdong, the Operation Red Sea. We've had uh, My Country, My People. 
Uh, many uh, more recently, the 800. So there's been a series of these kind of um, patriotic films that are doing very well at the box office. And meanwhile, Hollywood films are having an increasingly difficult time gaining a foothold in China. And I think it's also tied to a rise in nationalist sentiment where local audiences are much more inclined to want to support a local film than a Hollywood film. It's just, you know, this is a very natural sentiment given the tension between the US and China. People aren't gonna to wanna to give their money to America when they can support local films. And so for Hollywood, this is probably the greatest challenge they've ever faced because it's a, a brand new model that I don't think uh, they've encountered before. So anyway, that's an initial response to Jason's question. Did you wanna follow, did, did I get everything? Or you had a follow-up about recommendations? Um. Right? Yes, yes. Uh, like recommendation. I think like what around uh two thousands. Like there's some like amazing films. Like, um, my friend just watched Fa Wang Biezi, so I'm trying to watch that. Um, and then um, I I do want to like ask you about like this movie specifically because I watched it last year and then as I like, fascinated by it. I'm sure you know it is uh called Rang Zidan Fei or Let the Bullets Fly. And then I just like afterwards I always have um. I always go on this website called Douban to read movie reviews and stuff. And like according to those reviews, like this this movie is kind of is kind of like inferring about like you know CCP not doing like like good things and stuff. Like it's almost like kind of like a the theory about how like the 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 director is like hiding all those facts and like kind of hidden storyline. That's kind of almost like you know accusing of the 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 CCP of like turning against the people like you know after 1949 and stuff and then so like um have you watched this movie and like do you like 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 just like know what I'm talking about and stuff sure sure um so the the Rang Zidanfei um is a film by Jiang Wen who was one China's leading actor for many years and then he turned to directing in the 90s and has since become one of China's top grossing film directors and there, he does play with allegory and these kind of, uh, he leaves a certain, he plays with a liminal space between what's approved and what you can kind of sneak in, what Martin Scorsese would call a smuggler, right? Kind of smuggling these ideas into his films under the radar of the censors at times. And he was able to do that because he's not coming out black and white and saying this, but he's just making subtle inferences and whether and how much of those are intended or unintended or audiences over reading or accurately reading is all up to debate. He'll never come out and say, yes, this was meant to be X, Y, and Z. Um, but honestly, I'm, I've, that film did very well for him. It was a real blockbuster, but I've always, when I think of Jiang Wen, his di directorial debut, I believe it was around 1995 called uh, In the Heat of the Sun. Uh, Yang Guang Tan Lan the Ruz is the Chinese title. That's always been not only my favorite film of his, but I think really one of the standout films of the the last you know twenty five years. It's really an incredible, incredible film. It's you mentioned Bao Wang Biaji, uh, Farewell My uh, Concubine. Uh, Farewell My Concubine came out in the early nineties and it was part of a trio of films that all looked at the cultural revolution through the lens of trauma and suffering. So you had the uh, to Live by Zhang Yimou, you had uh, The Blue Kite by Tian Zhong Zhong, and you had Chen Kai Guo make um, For All My Concubine. And all of them were quite similar in terms of the historical judgment they placed on the Cultural Revolution. Jiang Wen's film is important because it pres presents the Cultural Revolution from a completely different perspective. He was not a victim during that period. He was someone who, because of the Cultural Revolution, got unprecedented kind of liberation. His parents were busy. A uh, kid his age was too, too young to be a red guard. Um, and so therefore he was, and schools were closed. So it was this period of kind of wild liberation. It's actually ad adopted from a novella called Wild Animals. And so it's this portrait of kids just gone wild. The parents aren't away. There's chaos in the streets. There's infighting between these different political factions. And I think it's an important film in terms of giving us an alternative perspective on what the Cultural Revolution meant to different types of people. It wasn't a unified experience. Um, 
And at the same time, it exhibited, I think, a real incredible use of film language, metaphor, montage. It really just established him just exploding onto the scene as one of the most creative uh, filmmakers of his generation. I, I have to say, honestly, I'm disappointed he didn't kind of live up to that promise in that first film, because that film really hinted at incredible things to come. And I felt that many of his later films kind of struggled a little bit. But anyway, that's I'm probably talking too much, but that's my response to, to that. But I definitely recommend you all to check out In the Heat of the Sun if you can find it. I, I absolutely will. Thank you so much. Sure. Alexander, you want to tell us about yourself and let us know if you have a question? Yeah, sure. So thank you so much for coming to speak with us today, Mr. Barry. And also thank you, Atre, for hosting this panel. Really interesting um, topic. So I'm a senior uh, at Tufts. I'm a member of the Epic Colloquium. And I guess the reason I'm here today is so part of our major spring assignment is to, to produce a pretty significant research paper. And the topic that I'm actually looking at is Chinese soft power and the ability of China and the CCP to export their ideology and their culture all around the world. And obviously cinema um, and the movie industry is a major role, a major part of that. It's what we're going to be looking at a lot. So I was just wondering, I guess, if I had a question, how you feel, you know, I know you mentioned Hollywood being challenged by all of this, um, how you feel China has been doing, especially as of recent, in the actual exportation of their cinema culture, you know, how much they do need the rest of the world, or if they really can just rely on their massive population within their own borders. Yeah, that's a, it's a great question. And it's a big question. It's, um, for several, about in roughly 2013 or 2014, Xi Jinping actually gave a speech where he called upon Chinese artists and writers and filmmakers and intellectuals to send Chinese culture out into the world. And aligned with that, there was a massive expansion of Confucius Institutes, there was translation subsidies to translate Chinese literature, and there was a real urge to open studios in Hollywood and other global hubs of filmmaking to try to make Chinese cinema, you know, more visible to, to the world. And I have to say that, that they haven't been that successful in exporting Chinese films globally. So you don't see, if you look at, I mean, look at the, for, for the last decade, and if you, if you looked at the Chinese top 10 films on any given week, with the exception of periods where there were political blackouts, there would almost always be Hollywood films in the top 10. You look at the US box office or the Indian box office or the British box office, how many Chinese films are in their top 10 films of the week? It, it, they haven't cracked the code, so to speak, and found that thing that will make Chinese films more accessible to mass numbers of global audiences. And they've tried different formulas to try to do that. For instance, there was a period um, around 2010, give or take, where several, several of China's top directors, like Zhang Yimou, Feng Xiaogang, Chen Kai Ge, they all tried making films um, to combine Hollywood and the US. And the, the typical way they did that was to take a Chinese story and plug in A list. Hollywood actors. And so you have examples like Back to 1942, a film by Feng Xiaogang, which starred Tim Robbins and Adrian Brody, or uh, Flowers of War, uh, Jinling Shi San Chai by Zhang Yimo, which starred Christian Bale in a film about the Nanjing Massacre, or The Great Wall, a Zhang Yimou film starring Matt Damon. There was one after another these kind of attempts to combine the two. And the thought was, if we get an A-list Hollywood actor, a Christian Bale, you know, Batman himself, <laughs> you know, how can we fail? We get a great story, a great historical backdrop. You plug in a Hollywood superstar. And most of these films did pretty well in the Chinese market, but none of them got a major foothold abroad. And so that formula was clearly not working and it culminated with The Great Wall, which was the ultimate failure. It lost something like $70 million uh, for the producers. And, and not only the loss of money, but I think for all other film companies in China, they saw that failure as the kind of nail in the coffin to the so-called co-production model. And a lot of them thought it just isn't working. It was also around that time, you started to see an alternative way to leverage soft power, which was not making a film about China, but having Chinese investors pour money into Hollywood. And so it was right around 2000 and 
2005, maybe 2006, that if you started to pay attention to the credits of your favorite Hollywood blockbuster movies, you'd see, you know, I remember being in the theater for Mission Impossible Rogue Nation and it's opened up and it said produced by Alibaba Pictures and China Film Channel. And one after another, all of these big tentpole Hollywood films started to have major investment from Chinese financiers. Um, to, that's also, you can look at that as another aspect of this soft power game. And even though they're not making films about China, uh, I mean, a film like uh, the, uh, Green Book, which won Best Picture at the Academy Awards a few years ago. People keep wondering, when is uh, China gonna win an Academy Award? Green Book was financed by a Chinese production company. So in some sense, they already have. They've already won that battle in, in a sense. Um, so, but that's another way that this kind of works invisibly. And unless you're scrutinizing the credits, a lot of people might realize that films like Smurfs, you know, and Terminator, the most recent Terminator, and so many of these big Hollywood style action films are actually in large part funded by Chinese money, at least they have been over the last several years. And so that's another way that this has been playing out. Of course, the trade war has changed all of this and complicated things greatly. But from, you know, 2005, you know, all and, and gaining speed from around that time all the way up until around, you know, 2008, 8, 17 is when things started hitting some hurdles. Um, there had been a lot of Chinese investment in, in Hollywood films. Yeah. And is, did that answer your question, Alex, or any follow up or? You yeah, thank you very much. The, the point about, I actually had no clue about the Chinese financing of Hollywood films. It's a really interesting um, thing to know. Thank you. Sure, sure. Uh, Layla, am I pronouncing that right? Yes, thank you. Um, thanks, Professor Barry. It, it, it's such a fascinating um, talk. It's like, I, I love films, but I actually haven't watched a ton of Chinese films being a Chinese myself. Um, so, so, so I am graduated from Tufts University, and I was a former Epic member. Um, the theme of our year was liberal world order. So, myself, my preference is to watch films that have more universal and transcendent themes. So, I guess my question is: um, Do you know of any films that, um, what we touched upon, Chinese films haven't done very well overseas, just generally? But are there films that have universal themes that you think are have potential? Um, of striking a chord in an international audience. Definitely, definitely. Um, I think any good film, if it's a good film, it's gonna transcend those boundaries and it's gonna to speak to the human condition in ways that go beyond you know, one language or one culture. And so there's many films out of China that I try to champion and push forward. And uh, if you want some recommendations, I mean, that's just, I'm, I'm gonna go a little broader than just PRC, but just Chinese language cinema in general. Uh, there's a filmmaker who passed away several years ago named Edward Yang, who was originally from Taiwan. And he has a film called E.E., Y-I-Y-I. Just a gorgeous, powerful film of, it's a basically a family genre, a multi-generational. So you have protagonists from your know, small children, young adults, teenagers, uh, middle someone going through a middle life crisis, their elderly parents suffering from uh, health issues, and through what happens just in the course of a couple days through the lens of this family, it's just such a, a really powerful, beautiful film. Um, so I would recommend Edward Yang, uh, EE. E. Also, he has a film called A Brighter Summer Day. Both of those films are distributed by the Criterion Collection in the US. So there's beautiful 4K restorations and special features and all of that. So I would recommend those. Um, I think Jason earlier also was asking for recommendations. Uh, there's a film, Blind Shaft, by a PRC filmmaker named Li Yang, who studied in Germany. Uh, uh, really powerful and disturbing film, but incredible, incredible storytelling and, and very dark, but um, definitely worth watching. So I would recommend Blind Shaft. Uh, there's a film director in China today named Jia Zhangke, who I've written quite a bit about over the years. And I would strongly recommend his early films, especially Xiao Wu and Platform. I can, uh, I'll, I'll type the 
titles in the chat for everyone. Thanks. Yeah, I found blind chat already. It's called Mangjing in Chinese, right? So yes. Xiao um, Thank you. I I found it. Okay. Oh wow. Yeah. So those are those are a couple titles you guys can look for. Uh, if you're interested in martial arts films, um, honestly, I think a lot of the martial arts films being produced these days are kind of garbage. <laughs> but I I have a soft spot in, in my heart for a filmmaker named King Hu, who was in Chinese. His name is uh, Hu Jintran. I will put that into. He is really kind of the, the pinnacle of this wuxia genre of martial arts filmmaking. And he was active from the mid 60s. Uh, he was active all the way through the 80s, but his masterpieces are all done in the, from the mid 60s to the late 70s. And so uh, he did a few films like Legend of the Mountain, Raining in the Mountain, A Touch of Zen, uh, just gorgeous. And uh, not just for the action sequences, but gorgeous cinematography and attention to detail and recreation of this kind of imaginary landscape of what traditional China looked like. And uh, I would strongly recommend King Hu's films as well. Um, and of course, I have to say Ho Xiaoxian. Uh, he's a Taiwan film director, makes uh, really, if you're interested in art house cinema, his films are challenging, moving, beautiful, introspective, layered, nuanced. Uh, they're the kind of films you watch once and twice and 10 times and you're still learning and you're still discovering new details in them. So anyway, those are a couple of recommendations for everybody. Wow, thanks. Uh, definitely a stuff to do rather than writing homework this weekend. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Yan Qing, you wanna introduce yourself? Yeah. Um, hi, thank you so much for um, hosting this um, panel and discussion. Mm -hmm. I was also a former EPIC student, actually did it last year, um, with the topic being um, genocide and mass atrocities prevention. And I guess my question for you, because I like grew up, um, I grew up in China and then I moved here. And I feel like, like every year, um, like during the national holiday, they always put out like a very like patriotic themed film or just some sort of um, film that promotes this like patriotic message. I'm just like curious to know, like where do you think the Chinese cinema, like cinematic industry is heading in the future? Like what are some of the messages that they're trying to get out like is it still the same like patriotic message or are we seeing like um some changes in this trend no we i hate to say it but i feel like going backward a little bit in terms of we we the chinese film market had moved away somewhat from the patriotic messages and they were still there in, in many films, but there, were, there was another type of films that, like we talked about with Jiang Wen, that were able to explore that liminal space, that kind of edgy space, neither here nor there, but they could get away with more. What's happened was under Xi Jinping, the, 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 cre the, the sphere in which creativity is possible is retracting. It's getting smaller and smaller. Um, and this is all kinds of filmmakers and writers who I know in China talk to me about this. I even, the last six months, I had probably had six mainland Chinese writers who are established writers, many books out, and they have texted me and said, hey, I, might, I can't get my latest novel published. Do you know any publishers in Taiwan that might be able to help me with this? Uh, film, I have a friend who's a filmmaker here in Los Angeles who is just kind of hanging out, laying low. She says, you know, it's not a, it's not the time to make films in China because you just, there's so the type of film, she's an independent um, film director and the types of films she makes, you just can't make in China right now. And so there's an increasing number of filmmakers and artists who are pursuing 
they, they've become kind of dissidents, so to speak. They, they're in New York, they're in Paris, they're in Los Angeles because there's no space for them to, to, to continue working in China. And about, let's say five years ago or so, there was a major shift in policy in the Chinese film industry, wherein the entire industry was now under the, uh, uh, the Ministry of Propaganda, the Shenzhen Bu. And so that's a big shift. I mean, we had kind of detached film to some degree from propaganda, but then they put it back in. And so uh, there's the, the censorship process is still quite stringent. And, and I, like I said earlier, I think there's a certain perfection to how to marry propaganda with commercial genres that is becoming very effective. And that's picking up steam, and when you, if you can make a film like that, that makes $800 million, they're gonna keep making them. Um, and these films that, you know, project core values, right? And that uh, pre present this liang, uh, right? The, the positive energy, <laughs> you know, these are all political terms, right? The politically correct films. And so we're seeing more and more of those. And what's happening is that alternative voices, independent films, edgy films, experimental films, uh, films that present a different side of society, there's increasingly less space for those to be made, exhibited, or even exist. And so we're getting, I, I feel like any healthy film market, you need to have a multitude of different voices and perspectives. But what we're seeing is this distillation to one type of film, one voice, one story that's advocated, one vision of history. And if you deviate from that, you're out. And so artists are faced with a very dire situation. It's either get on board and be a good boy and a good girl and make the films that they want you to make. And if you do that, you will probably financially prosper and do well and have accolades. However, if you don't get in line, you either shut up and don't make films anymore or you go abroad and you become a dissident. I mean, there's, there's, there's just, there, you don't have that middle ground where you can make, you know, you know, people like, uh, I mean, uh, th there's a lot of filmmakers that have been f faced to make these difficult choices. And so uh, I think it's becoming really challenging the last couple of years due to current policy changes and the trade war or cold war with the United States has only exacerbated things and made it much worse. And, and it's led to a situation where so many cultural figures in China kind of feel you're with us or you're against us. And everything is now in black and white, just like it was in Mao's 1942 talks. And that is, I feel, a really sad step backward. Yeah. Did I answer your question, Yanqing? Yeah, thank you. Sure. Uh, Yuzair, am I pronouncing your name correctly? Yes, yes, you are. You have. A, you want to introduce yourself, and do you have a question? Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm a senior at Tufts University. I'm studying international relations. I'm sorry, I, I just got back from outside, so I've pretty much missed the entirety of the first half of this session. So I don't have a question right now, but um, if if through this conversation something comes up, I'll be sure to let you know. Sure. Feel free to jump in if something comes up, David. Or did we have David? I, the, the, yeah, go Hello. ahead. David. Yeah, hi, I'm David. I'm a sophomore at Tufts and I'm part of the Epic, Epic Colloquium. And uh, yeah, I'm, I don't really have a question, but it's very interesting to hear because I don't know too much about Chinese films. Okay. Anything you're curious about or want to hear more about? I think Jason actually addressed most of what I was interested in, all the recommendations and such. Okay. Yeah, and in recommendations, of course, everyone has their own type of film they prefer. So is there, I should ask you, David, is there a certain genre or type that you gravitate towards and I can tailor fit recommendations for you? I'll have to think about it. Can you come back to me? Sure. Okay, Kevin. You there, Kevin? I have a question. Um, if I get yeah. the word, um, that's fine. Please. I was, I was curious to understand the portrayal of um, the peripheral and like the central areas of China within Chinese cinema. So this is peripheral areas like Tibet, Xinjiang, or like central areas that's like central China, rural China. What's the portrayal of them in Chinese cinema? How has that changed over the years? 
um, and what is Chinese cinema trying to make a picture of from there? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, that's also undergone radical transformations over the decades. For most of PRC film history, portrayals of ethnic minorities in China have been made by Han Chinese, which is the majority, right? And so there's been a certain othering, right? Um, you, you, for most of this history, you didn't have minority directors making films about themselves and telling their own stories. It was told for them. And so, for instance, in the 1950s, there was a film called Nongnu, uh, Surfs, uh, literally like um, the you know, agrarian slaves, I guess would be the title. And it was a film about Tibet by a Han, Ch Han Chinese director. And it actually beautifully shot the cinematography. If you see this film, it's some of the most gorgeous black and white cinematography you'll ever encounter. But in terms of the ideological thrust of the film, it was very much in line with PRC political ideology. So it was showing uh, how Tibetan people were exploited and taken advantage of by the land Lord system and, and everyone else was kind of a slave and they were whipped and they were beaten. And, and it basically serves as political justification for why they needed to be quote unquote liberated by the CCP government. Because of course, 1959, there was a major incident in, in Tibet where the P PLA army moved in, they took over and the Dalai Lama fled to India and we, we all know, know the story. And so there was, a movement in film to try to tell the correct version of history, right? And why it was a need for the Chinese government to move into Tibet. And films like uh, Serfs tried to do that work, the, the cultural work, the ideological work, you know, this was soft power before soft power. And so, and, and then there were also a lot of films like uh, Liu Sanjia, uh, Sister Liu, uh, where th they kind of, it, show off the song and dance of traditional Chinese minorities when the scenery and the beautiful colors. And, um, and there were a lot of these, there's, there's like a whole genre of minority films in China from the late, early fifties, all the way through the seventies. You have a whole series of these types of films. Um, today, it's changed quite a bit. You still get some of that stuff happening in films, but you do have a lot of independent filmmakers who are now trying to present an alternative view of what life is like in these uh, marginal regions or areas with more minority individuals. So well, one of the best examples is a filmmaker named Wan Ma Tsai Dan or Pedan Tsema, who is a Tibetan director and one of the first ethnic Tibetan directors who has been making a series of really gorgeous, powerful films. They're art films, so they're kind of experimental, maybe a little difficult for mainstream audiences, but really a brilliant filmmaker. And he's been making films for the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years, films like Old Dog, uh, uh, um, Red, uh, the, the, the Balloon, I think, is one of his more recent films. But he's, he's a real wonderful artist to, to check out if you're interested in art cinema. But there, are, there is a rise of filmmakers like that. But of course, all of these filmmakers know that there are red lines you can't cross. And so like today in the West, in the headlines, you hear about the Xinjiang camps and you hear about you know, self-immolation in Tibet and all of these explosive, politically controversial issues. You won't see portrayals of any of that in Chinese films about minorities. And the result is you get a real imbalanced view because there are certain topics in China that are invisible. They just don't exist. You cannot hear anything about them. And then in the West, that's all you hear about. And so both sides are kind of at an extreme place in terms of how they engage with minority cultures. And so if, if you live here in the United States, probably all you think of when you think of minorities in China is the human rights violations. And if you live in China, you, that's the last thing you think about because it's just erased from the news. And so I think for those of us who are bilingual and bicultural, the best is you, you, you take it all in and you kind of got to make your own decision and your own get, gain your own perspective. Because if you're only getting media from one source, it's certainly going to be highly skewed and highly prejudicial. And so that's why, uh, and if, you, and if you're not multilingual, that's fine. All of these 
you know, whether it's China or America or India, they all have English language media where you can get their perspective, uh, even if you're a monolingual person. But I think it's really important to do that, to try to create your own more balanced interpretation of what's happening globally. Yeah. Uh, who is next? Kevin? Michael, I didn't talk to you. I was muted. Okay, go ahead, Kevin. Kevin. Michael, I'm not uh, current the top students, uh, and uh, but I was a top saloon some years ago, and I'm a member of the uh, advisory board of uh, IGL. So uh, when I saw your name, I was excited because I, I watched you and uh, Professor Dittman last Thursday. Okay, great. To talk about Zhang Yimou. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I thought it was a very interesting. And uh, uh, first of all, I want to appreciate, I, I want to thank you for, uh, you know, coming to Tufts and uh, talking to our, our students. I think it's a wonderful uh, thing for you to do. And I'm not going to take a, a time from the students. I just want to make a general comment. In the past couple of days, we talk about technology, politics, economy, you name it. Okay, but what I feel, and I think the students could uh, uh, tell me if I'm wrong, there's a lack of a cultural aspect. If you think about the US-China relations, it really started with the culture. And I don't know if uh, the students remember the, the, the ping pong diplomacy is what really started, right? And uh, in the last uh, uh, session, um, Andre also uh, moderated, you know, people keep saying, we need to divide government from people. Can you divide? You really cannot, right? You really cannot. And at the end of the day, what really glued China and US together, in my personal opinion, is people, is culture. So I, I really think, you know, cinema is such a big part of the culture. It has such broad uh, reach to people. And uh, so when you talk about the positive energy coming out of a cinema, coming out of this, cultural impact, I, I think it's great. I think it's very important. So I, I just want to make the comment. I want to leave the time uh, for the students. No, oh, thank you, Kevin. I appreciate that. And, and I totally agree. I mean, for the last couple of years, when we think of China, you, all you hear is trade war, trade war, the new cold war, right? right? I've always felt for years, the bigger story behind that is the culture imbalance, not the trade imbalance, but the cultural imbalance, the lack of understanding. And so much of the trade war and the so-called cold war is due, I think, to the lack of understanding, the lack of engagement. And the real tragedy is now that there is this tension between China and the US, the reaction of both sides is to do what? To shut down things. So you see all these programs, exchange programs, uh, Fulbright, um, embassies closing, um, you know, pro just funding being cut off, Confucius Institutes being shut down, all of these uh, different ways in which the governments are pulling back and becoming more and more insular and inward looking. That's the opposite of what we need. We need more engagement. We need more understanding. And because that's what got us into this problem in the first place. And I think China actually has done a much better job at understanding America than America has done understanding China. I think uh, just turn on CCTV and sure a lot of it's propagandistic, but if there's an earthquake in Argentina, if there's an election in the Philippines, if there's a humanitarian crisis in Thailand, you see that in the CCT news. If you look at CNN, at least the last year, Trump, 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 because it's all ratings based, whereas uh, CCTV, it's more, because it's a socialist country, they have a, uh, call it propaganda, call it education, but they're not beholden to the ratings in the way that Fox or CNN are. And so that the news just is skewed to what eyeballs are attracted to. 
And, and so, and you see this manifested so powerfully in just everyday interactions with people and their basic knowledge of the other country. And so if, if you go to a Chinese university and walk around campus and just talk to random students and ask them, hey, do you know who Mark Twain is? Do you know who Abraham Lincoln is? Do you know who uh, Dustin Hoffman is? They probably have all heard those names, you know, or Michael Jackson, you know, they know all these people. If you walk around, if I walk around UCLA or you guys walk around Tufts and grab average American kids and ask them, hey, who is Lu Xun? Who is Zhou Enlai? Who is Ba Jin, Mao Dun, you know, uh, Mo Yan? Most American students have never heard any of those names. And, and it speaks to an incredibly tragic kind of the, the insular nation, nature of so many Americans who just have blinders on and they only care about what impacts them and their daily lives. And I think we need to wake them up and uh, that they're not the center of the world anymore. <laughs> and, and we're an interconnected world and interconnected culture. And I think there's a responsibility to, for all of us to get outside of our shelves, shells and try to understand other cultures in a more proactive way. That's the only way I think we're gonna get out of this, this trade war, this tension that we're having. I think there's such a deep fundamental misunderstanding, again, on both sides, but I think in particular, the US needs to do more work in catching up. I mean, look at even language, you know, kids in China, throughout China, elementary school students are all studying English. How many Americans are studying Chinese? There's just a fundamental imbalance here. I, I can't agree, you know, uh, uh, more with you. It, it's uh, it's uh, um, it's something, you know. Um, I think people uh, in both country, and especially, I I I have hope in the students, the younger generation, you know, to to help two countries. I was a beneficiary of the uh, China's uh, opened up, you know, in the late seventies. I was probably the first. I'm um, the first students to come to the US. Mm. And I value that. I value that greatly. So uh, anyway, Michael, uh, it's really, I'm sorry I didn't turn my camera on. I'm just uh, in a few different things, but I'll talk to more with you about a movie. One of my childhood friend is a long time uh, producer uh, for Zhang Yimou. Oh, wow. He made many movies, uh, To Live, Hero, and uh, the flying digger, blah, 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 uh, wow. with Zhang Yimou, so, uh, but some other time. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. No, I've, I also had the pleasure of working with Zhang Yimou for many years. I was his interpreter for, oh. uh, for a long time, yeah. I did some, Thank you. yeah, I subtitled a few of his films and, and I, when he used to come to the US to promote his films, I was his interpreter that would do junkets and events with him and things. Yeah, your Chinese is quite impressive. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. So just, can I ask a question? Do we have yes, ask? please. Um, so I was, so I, just as your, your conversation with uh, Mike, uh, with, with Kevin was like sort of alluding to recently, I think last week Tufts shut down the Confucius Institute on campus. So like we, we already see, you know, the, the reduction of people to people like cultural exchanges or just you know lived experiences at least on a campus level and so how how would you sort of help ensure that this sort of stops happening so that there's a lot more cultural exchange people to people relations that can kind of bridge the gaps that both of you were talking to um, because if it's not happening on a campus level you know where is it going to happen and so, um, yeah, I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, we, I, unfortunately, we can't rely on kind of the existing infrastructures, whether it be the government or our campus, um, necessarily to facilitate these kind of exchanges. And I think we have to do it on an individual level with reaching, with reading, visiting these countries, you know, interactions with uh, Chinese students, or it's not, it's not just US China, it's I think, it's a problem that crosses many, many countries. And I think we all need to work hard to be better global citizens and kind of, I feel like we all wear sunglasses or rose tinted glasses. And, and the color of that is determined by where you grow up, the language you speak, 
your religion, your, you know, that your parents, oh, so many things go into that. And it's like, and it, of course, this makes us who we are. And it, these are beautiful things, right? You, you should celebrate your culture and your religion and your language and all of this. At the same time, we have to be conscious about how those things can also be burdens and how they can make us prejudicial to other perspectives. And so, I mean, for me, for so much of my life, I feel like it's trying to take these glasses off or uh, in Chinese, there's the idiom jing di zhi wa, uh, the, the frog in the well, and where in the, in the idiom talks about a frog at the bottom of a well and it looks up and all it can see is that little slice of sky that is visible at the top of the well, a little circle, right, of, of, of clouds. And it thinks that's the world. And it's only until it emerges, right, that you realize, wow, there's, it's, that was just a tiny corner and there's so much more. And I feel like all of us are frogs in wells. And for me, one of my goals in life is not, because when you do climb out, you realize you're still in another well, a bigger well, and then you've got to climb out of that one. And then you've got to climb out of that one. And I feel like life is a process of climbing out of wells. And, and as you get older, you, you feel like maybe you made it out of one, then maybe another. And, and, but I think it takes hard work to do that because it, what it means is challenging your own internalized prejudices, assumptions, ideology, and realizing that it's a rich world and people in growing up in Pakistan and people growing up in Israel and people growing up in Holland, wherever, they all have a very different way of seeing the world. And, and I think the more of those divergent perspectives you expose yourself, the bigger your heart grows and the more embracing you become of other cultures and the more you are able to see yourself and your own culture's limitations in a more critical and thoughtful way. And so I think, and again, it's hard work, but I think it's something we should all strive for. But a lot of the hard work has to be done on an individual level. And so, yeah, I don't have a, a secret to it. It's just, it's, it's just doing, putting in the hours and the hard work and, and putting yourself in uncomfortable situations, you know, exposing yourself to things that aren't in your comfort zone, because that's ultimately going to make you grow. And Awesome. That in some ways is also what cinema does um, by like making us experience people's feelings, emotions um, through a medium in which like you can see through two to three hours of what something you completely don't understand can be is definitely an experience that is kind of similar to what you're talking about, but still um, that does not like that still warrants us to do everything we can do at an individual level. Um, that being said, um, I really want to thank you, uh, Dr. Michael Berry, for coming here. Thank you for your passion and thank you for your interest in cinema and culture. Um, this was super interesting to me and I'm sure for all of us who were here. Um, I really appreciate your time and I appreciate everyone else who was here. Um, a lot of us are epic people. So um, thank you. Thank you all for showing up again. Um, much appreciated. And thank you again, Dr. Barry. Um, I hope you all have a good weekend ahead. Yeah, it was uh, delightful to meet everybody and I wish you all the best in your studies and or, uh, Kevin, I think is done with his studies, but I wish you the best nevertheless in whatever endeavors you're doing. Um, and yeah, it's a pleasure to meet everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.